According to Beatrix Potter, there's something delicious about writing the first words of a story. One can never quite tell where they'll be taken. Beatrix's words brought her here, in London in the year of 1902. Now that she looks back, Beatrix realizes that the relationship between her and London has never been amicable. As an unmarried woman, she was expected to behave in very particular ways that certainly did not include traipsing from publisher to publisher with a group of friends. What's interesting is that these friends of hers are actually the characters she draws in her illustrations. As she packs them up in preparation for a meeting, she commands them to not talk too much or be afraid which is a reflection of her self-assurance. These friends or characters of hers weren't so well received by the men in authority at different publishing houses. She is at a similar meeting where she tells them that she's been selling her drawings for greeting cards and plays cards for seven years. However, all their reaction comprises is some silent sighs or disgruntled mumblings which makes it difficult for Beatrix to hold her composure. One of the two publishing brothers, Harold Warren finally speaks up with the drawing still in his hand. He comments on the attire of a rabbit character and wonders how Beatrix imagines such things. To this, she replies that these characters are real to her and she sees them as her friends. She elaborates that before the character of Peter Rabbit, there was Benjamin Bunny and then Sir Isaac the Newt. She offers to show them their drawings as well but Harold dismisses her, while not forgetting to note that she is unmarried. This isn't the first time she's been rejected so Beatrix takes the cue to leave when Fruing Warren speaks up. He announces that they can publish her character in a children's book. But he still advises her not to be very hopeful because he can already predict that very few copies of this will be sold. The best they can hope for is a small profit but this is enough for Beatrix who jumps at the opportunity and accepts it. She informs her chaperone, Miss Wigan that they can leave the office now while thanking the Warren brothers once more for this opportunity. Before walking out, she pauses and makes it known that she's very particular about book size and price. She also wants them to avoid the usual gothic typeface in their children's books. Fruing Warren reminds her to pick up her portfolio from the desk as she almost forgot it while leaving. Once she's gone, Harold questions his brother on this strange decision and it can be seen that none of them have any faith in Beatrix's idea. They both find this book ridiculous but Fruing said yes because he thought of their little brother Norman. Harold also understands now and remembers that they promised Norman a little project and Beatrix will be perfect for it. Oblivious to their plotting, Beatrix giddily directs her driver, Saunders, to drive her carriage through the park before heading home. She opens up her portfolio and starts talking to Peter the Rabbit about how they are about to present themselves to the world instead of staying home. She views this as an adventure and Miss Wigan sees her as a lunatic. As her carriage races through a park in London, Beatrix brings her head out to breathe in the fresh air. When she comes home, her mother, Helen Potter, inquires where she was all this time because she wanted to use the carriage too. Beatrix happily responds that she was out with her friends before walking upstairs to her room. Once she has settled down, Helen enters her room to continue their conversation. She reminds Beatrix that she doesn't have any friends. While she accepts the fact that some of her daughter's paintings are quite pretty, she is not willing to deceive her as her husband does. She doesn't think that this is great art and leaves the room after conveying her opinion. Beatrix isn't affected because she knows that she'll prove herself to everyone soon as a published author. She recalls working on these characters since she was a little girl. She would spend her time drawing while her brother Bertram would often torture animals or play around with insects after a their maid would bring them downstairs to bid farewell to their parents, Helen and Rupert Potter, who are heading out for an evening. Helen has always been very sociable and domestic and envisioned a similar life for her daughter. Rupert, on the other hand, always took an interest in Beatrix's drawings and used to appreciate her for improving her techniques. Before heading out with Helen, he called his children one day as he bought them gifts from Piccadilly. As her parents step into their carriage, little Beatrix watches from her window, and views the carriage being drawn by animated rabbits, just like the ones she draws. Bertram insists that he wants Beatrix to tell her bedtime story because he finds them funny. She plans to tell a story about two characters called Tom Thumb and Hunker Munker, based on their pair of pet mice. Beatrix narrates the story using her dolls and her dollhouse, reenacting the events of her story. She brings the mice out of their case for her story and sets them inside the dollhouse. Adult Beatrix is brought out of her fond childhood memory when Helen addresses her because there is someone there to see her. Beatrix discloses that the guests are her publishers and she's dreading to meet them. Meanwhile, Helen makes a point about how it's not good to invite tradespeople into one's home because they carry dust. Beatrix finally meets the youngest Warren brother, Norman, who introduces himself before sitting down. He has recently joined the firm and Beatrix's book has been assigned to him. She invites him to sit down and gets tea made for him while he goes through her designs. He genuinely likes her designs but she has more pressing matters to discuss. She brings up his brother's letter which had two proposals, both of whom she found unacceptable. She wants her drawings to be in black and white instead of color to reduce the cost. She also doesn't like the fact they want her to reduce the drawings by one-third. Norman clarifies that this was his idea and gives her the logical justification behind it. He adds that he wants her book to be colorful on the shelf so that it stands out from the other books. Beatrix is surprised to know that this will be the first book that Norman is supervising. 
He explains that he's made the decision to get a proper job working at his family's firm. Beatrix fully understands the tactics of his family now and so does Norman. He wants them to use this opportunity with something so remarkable that none would be able to deny its brilliance. He promises to even escort her to the printer himself so that she can see her art being created right before her. This ends their meeting on a positive note. Beatrix reminisces about her childhood once again. When she was 10, her mother badgered her father into spending the summer in the Lake District, like other families of their status. So all of their pets were boarded on the train with the Potter family while young Beatrix fell under the spell of freedom and fresh air. One day, as their maid dresses them, she narrates a precautionary tale of how the children shouldn't go deep into the woods to keep the kids in check. The mention of fairies and beasts inspires new games for Beatrix and Bertram who chase each other around their vacation home, and its surrounding woods. Beatrix stays busy drawing during those days while Helen keeps an eye on Bertram to ensure that he doesn't play with the peasants' kids whom she believes to be dirty. They try to catch a rabbit one day and Beatrix ends up covered in mud. Helen doesn't understand who will marry her with these antics but she seems to have no interest in marriage, because she prefers drawing. Beatrix is sure, even as a kid, that all the love she needs she can get from her art and her animals. However, Rupert thinks that she'll grow out of it. Turns out that he was wrong, because now Beatrix works with Norman to publish the story that she conjured up during that summer spent with her family. Norman stays true to his word and takes her to the printer where she watches her drawings come to life on paper, and gets to correct any imperfections. As he walks her to the carriage on the way back, she admits that this book has changed things for her. She can now prove to her mother that a 32-year-old unmarried woman like her can also achieve something. Norman relates to her, as his family didn't want him to get into publishing either. He later takes Beatrix to his house where she meets his mother, Mrs. Warren, and his sister, Millie. They liked Beatrix's work and insisted that Norman should bring her for tea as Millie wants to befriend her. She takes the group out to the garden for tea and expresses her love for gardening. Millie's mother disapproves of this hobby and Norman teases her about it. Mrs. Warren reveals that she likes reading English biographies instead of the romance novels published by her son. She thinks that a sweet boy like Norman shouldn't work especially when his brothers can provide for all of them. She prefers having him at home but he's more focused on work and a certain client right now. Beatrix shares the process of how she draws whatever she finds captivating or unusual. Mrs. Warren takes her leave after some time, requesting Beatrix to stay longer and teach Millie how to behave. Millie informs Beatrix that this means her mother really likes her. Helen is busy decorating her house when she shows Beatrix a blouse she pulled out of the laundry. It has a stain on it that's not getting washed off. Beatrix guesses that it's an ink stain she must have gotten from her time at the printer. Helen donates the blouse while reminding Beatrix that this was a waste of her father's money. But Beatrix is hopeful to be financially independent enough to buy her own clothes now while her mother clearly disapproves of Norman. They go over the many options of suitors her parents presented her but she knows how horrible they were as partners. They lacked personality even though they had sound backgrounds which was unacceptable for Beatrix. At this point, Norman visits their house unexpectedly which makes Helen criticize his unannounced presence too. Nevertheless, Beatrix joins Norman in his carriage and Wiggins' company, as he takes her to the bookstore. Her book is on display there and she learns over lunch with him that her book is selling well. He declares that she is an author and they have succeeded in proving others wrong about their competencies. Even though they're proud of their work, Beatrix is disappointed that her association with Norman will end now. With his hand slightly brushing hers, he puts forward the idea that she must have other stories to tell too. This reminds her of a story about a stupid duck that she thinks is based on herself. She thought that she'd forgotten it but now she remembers telling to someone she met during her summers in the Lake District. The groundsman's son was always interested in her stories and she remembers the day clearly now. It's raining and Willie Healy's finds her drying her sketchbook. He discovers a character in it called Jemima Puddle Duck whose story she hadn't fully developed yet. He likes her story so far and shows her around the valley while she wishes that she was better at drawing landscapes. As their walk ends, he mentions that he'll leave for Manchester next week to study law. She wishes him good luck while agreeing to send him some drawings. Beatrix appreciates to this day how he encouraged her to take her art seriously. Now with Norman's unwavering support, she feels confident enough to publish more books. During one of her meetings with Millie, she communicates the experience of when she decided not to get married. It was just before her 20th birthday when Helen informed her that one of the suitors she rejected had given the best life to his now wife. Beatrix knew there and then that she wouldn't get married now and Helen would no longer bring her suitors. Beatrix felt shock at first, followed by relief. Millie adds that men are bores and only good for financial support and procreation. Millie believes that unmarried women lead better lives because they don't have to deal with domestic enslavement or childbirth. They're both glad to find each other as friends because of how similar their thinking is. Norman publishes more of Beatrix's books and she later invites him and Millie to her family's annual Christmas party. Beatrix is painting in her room one day while talking to her characters when Helen informs her of her father's arrival. 
they hurry to welcome Rupert, after which, they present him with an issue because Beatrix invited the Warrens to Christmas dinner. Rupert pulls out a copy of her book that he bought with his money today. He found out that her book was all the rage among people at his club and finally hopped on the bandwagon. He apologizes to Beatrix for underestimating her. He calls her a genuine artist and expresses how proud he is of her while Helen goes through the book. He gladly allows her to extend the invitation to the Warrens as he thinks that this will be good for all of them. Helen has decorated the house like a marvel for the Christmas party. Rupert thanks her for her efforts while Beatrix receives her guests at the door. She introduces them to her parents as they're the first ones to arrive. Beatrix chats with Norman and Millie and makes a joke about how Wigan has been strictly ordered to stay by their side always. Once they've had dinner, Helen comes up to them because one of their guests Sir Nigel is short of a player for his card game. While Norman is of no help, Millie volunteers to join the game. Now that Beatrix and Norman are left alone with Wigan, she brings him upstairs to show him his Christmas present. She leads him into her art room, not worried about how scandalous this could be. He looks around the room, surveying different objects from her childhood while Wigan falls asleep after having too much brandy. They open a music box and in a natural and magical moment, Norman begins to sing a melody as she places her hand in his. They dance slowly after which they both find themselves breathless due to the proximity in that moment. He is aware of her decision to not marry and he previously had a similar intent for himself too. But now something has changed and he musters his courage to ask her a question he does not expect an immediate answer to. As he's about to say the inevitable, Helen interrupts them and they all return downstairs, still flustered. The guests see a painting in Beatrix's hand that's supposed to be Norman's gift, and inquire about it. She reveals that she's writing a Christmas story for him as a present of gratitude. The guests urge her to share a glimpse of this unfinished story and she complies. When Helen gets there, she's impressed to see the command her daughter has over everyone in that room and how they're all sitting down to listen to her intently. By the time she's done with her story, everyone compliments her talent. Beatrix pulls Millie aside as she's her confidante. She blurts out that Norman has proposed to her and that she's very inclined to say yes. She seeks Millie's approval because she doesn't want her to feel left out. Millie gives her the pep talk she needs to go ahead with her decision to say yes to Norman until Helen finds them. Beatrix is directed to entertain their guests while Helen complains about feeling like a stranger in her own home. Sir Nigel and his wife appreciate Beatrix before leaving and advise Millie to take up knitting. Once they've gone, Millie elaborates that Sir Nigel disapproves of her way of playing cards because she beat him twice. Beatrix reminds Norman of his painting and says yes to him while handing it. Delighted, he bids farewell to the potters and Beatrix runs up to her room, blushing. That night, she opens her music box again and sways to its tune with tears of joy rolling down her cheeks. The next day, Norman makes an appointment to see Rupert at his club and walks in with fresh snow under his shoes. He gives himself some self-assurance before knocking and getting the approval to enter. He comes out of the room ten minutes later, thanking Rupert for his time. The maids in the Potter house have a field day as they pry on the argument Beatrix is having with her parents. Wigan shoes them all away while Beatrix announces her adamant decision to marry Norman. But her parents can't let her do that because no potter can marry into the trade. Beatrix points out that both her maternal and paternal grandfathers were tradesmen like Norman too, and they're nothing but a family of social climbers. Her parents still don't allow this marriage, presumably for her own good. She takes a stand against her family because she's set in her intent to marry Norman. Helen threatens to cut her off of her inheritance which causes her to point out that Bertram wasn't disinherited for running off with the wine merchant's daughter. Yet, she doesn't care for their inheritance as she earns for herself now. After storming off and locking herself in her room, she hears a knock on the door. She lets her father in who clarifies that he came after her on his own will, instead of Helen's request. He wants to resolve this matter and do what's best for his daughter. He estimates that she will ultimately regret this impulsive and inappropriate marriage. He confronts her for rejecting numerous suitable proposals and she justifies her reasoning for doing so. She admits that she wants to be loved which leaves Rupert quiet. Later on, Beatrix leaves Wigan outside Mr. Copperwade's office, where she goes to look into her royalty earnings. She wants to know if she can afford to have a house of her own in the country at some stage. To her surprise, she finds out that she's wealthy enough to buy an estate. If her income continues to grow, she'll be set for life financially. Her parents convince her to join them for dinner that evening because they have a proposition for her. They don't want her to rush into something that she might reconsider later. They're not convinced yet but want to give her some leniency too. So, the proposition is that she may accept Norman but it must remain a complete secret even from his own family. Her parents will be in Lake District as usual during summer, and if she wishes to proceed by the end of the summer, then they'll announce her engagement so that she can marry with their love and blessing. The secrecy is so that there won't be any public embarrassment if she changes her decision. She accepts their terms because she has faith that her love can withstand time. 
Norman later slips an engagement ring on Beatrix's finger while they continue to spend time together as a couple. Beatrix boards the train with her parents for their summer vacation and it starts to rain heavily. Norman still shows up to see her off and assures her that it'll only be three months until her parents will come fully on board with their marriage. The steam from the locomotive surrounds them, barricading them from the rest of the world and he kisses her goodbye. She spends her summer writing letters to him about how much she misses him and he writes back to her detailing his progress in the process of becoming a businessman. They exchange sweet confessions of adoration and longing for each other over mail throughout these three months of summer. One day, she runs into Willie Healy's as he is posting a sign to sell the hilltop farm which used to belong to his father. He offers to show her around the farm and she later mentions the place to Norman in her letters. She plans to buy it as a country home for them because she's eager to share her favorite places with him. He doesn't write her back for many days until she receives a letter from Millie conveying that he's ill. Beatrix sets out for home at once but it turns out that she is too late. Millie explains how he got a cough over the summer which worsened so much that he suddenly passed away one night. His funeral has passed and couldn't be delayed in waiting for her arrival, because no one knew about them except Millie. Harold and Fruing politely see Beatrix out because they only want close family in their house right now. Beatrix finally breaks down into uncontrollable sobs due to grief once she retires to her room. She refuses to eat or go back to the Lake District and shuts herself in her room. She skulks and mourns around the empty house until the night she pours her heart out on paper. She keeps drawing and painting until the sun rises but all her characters seem to run away from her now. Millie comes to check up on her and discovers that Beatrix is failing to function due to the loss she's suffering from. Millie consoles her friend Beatrix makes a decision to move out of her parents' home. After some time, she pulls herself together and purchases Hilltop Farm from Willie Healy's. Helen doesn't understand how Beatrix will support herself when Rupert reminds her that their daughter is famous and whose work is bought by many people. Beatrix makes it clear that this decision is only because she wants to make her own way. Finally, she moves to Hilltop Farm to give her characters a new home, while forbidding them to shed any more tears. Yet, she cries herself to sleep every night. One morning, she walks out into an open field, inhaling the fresh country air. This drives her to set up a workstation and resume creating her art. Millie comes over to visit her and brings her the painting she gifted Norman on the night he proposed to her at the Christmas party. They go for a stroll in the woods and talk about how time is making it easier for them to deal with the pain. Beatrix has also reached an understanding with her mother where they just let each other be. Now, Beatrix sits with her back against a tree as she paints out in nature. She works around the farm and attends a farmer's council meeting where Willie is also present. He finds her at the farm and is pleased to see that she's keeping the essence of this place alive. The two farms adjoining her property can fall prey to developers so she buys them at an auction. She gives a shut-up call to the condescending developers. Eight years later, she married William Healy's despite her mother's disapproval and donated 4,000 acres of farmland. Her stores became the best-selling children's books of all time. 